Uh, my name is Anita Moncrief, I'm known as the Acorn Whistleblower, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about election integrity. But before I get there, I wanted to give you a little bit of background because there's always a question of how did you get to where you are now as a former Acorn employee to be speaking in front of conservatives and to be a conservative activist. So some of you have already heard this story, and uh, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of how, uh, basically what happened and why today I'm working with um, you guys to take back America. In 2005, I joined the Strategic Writing and Research Department of ACORN Political Operations uh, and its sister organization, Project Vote. Project Vote was the organization that Obama worked for in the 90s, and when I got there, I thought that I was going to help end poverty and work in the communities, all these great idealistic things that ACORN promises to people. Uh, what I quickly found out is that ACORN was not what it uh, appeared to be. Number one, uh, when I was hired, they said I was working for ACORN, but when I got there, I was working for Project Vote. Project Vote is a 501c3 nonprofit. It cannot engage in part partisan political activity. But while I was working for Project Vote, I was simultaneously working for ACORN, a C3, I mean a C4, which does engage in partisan politi political activity. The money was coming in tax exempt through Project Vote, and ACORN was using it to get Democrats elected. That's the first thing I found out. The second thing I found out is that I was tasked to research the voter fraud allegations coming out of the 2004 elections. I don't know if you guys remember this, but um, they had a massive campaign to get rid of George Bush in 2004. They created websites, they likened him to Hitler and other types of dictators, and George Soros pumped millions of dollars into the left in order to get Kerry elected over Bush. They were still upset about the 2000 elections and they were going to do whatever it took to get him out of office. So from that came massive allegations of voter fraud across the country, Missouri, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida. So it was my job to research these allegations and to try to make ACORN look good. So, and this was harder than it seemed. <laughs> In Missouri, nine employees were indicted for voter fraud, uh, everything from registering Mickey Mouse to dead people. Um, in Pennsylvania and Ohio, they closed the ACORN office and got out of town right ahead of prosecution. It's like days, there were boxes and computers just left there as people ran out of town. All of that stuff was shipped to the DC office and I had to go through it. And I found things that you wouldn't even believe. And, but it was my job to make ACORN look good. So when I turned in my report, the report I got back showed that it was rogue employees who were defrauding the organization for money and it wasn't ACORN. Even though there was a pattern across the country that showed that these employees had to have been trained the exact same way to do these things, ACORN said it was rogue employees. Those people were thrown under the bus and prosecuted and the organization continued on. So from there, we're going to fast forward to 2007. I'm working in the ACORN office. I had just come back from a retreat in Arkansas where the executive director of, of Project Vote, who simultaneously also was the political director of ACORN, got up in front of a group of employees and said, I supervised Barack Obama in the 90s and ACORN produces leaders. What he was telling us, all those community organizers together, was that we too could be the president of the United States from working at ACORN. There are documents at ACORN that date back to 2006, before Barack Obama got up at the DNC National Convention and made a name for himself that said Obama in 08. This was all planned through SEIU and ACORN. So there I was in that office in 2007, and the phone rang in Washington, D.C., and I picked it up, and it was someone from the Obama campaign. And they wanted to know if this was the same project vote that Obama had worked with in the 90s. And the reason why is because there's a project vote smart and sometimes we get their mail and their phone calls. So uh, I guess they had called the wrong one first and they wanted to make sure this was the right one. I told them it was, and they wanted to talk to my supervisors. I was the only person in the DC office. That was quite um, usual. I was the only person working there, so I took the message and I sent it on to my supervisors. Not a week later, the development director, Karen Gillette, comes in with a USB drive about this big. She hands it to me, and on there is the 2007 Obama donor list, the list that um, he, it was the second quarter list, the list that was, uh, he did not turn over to the FEC. It was more complete than the list he turned over to the FEC because it included the lower dollar donors. There was a lot of contention over those smaller dollar donors because the website had turned off their security verifications and credit card transactions were coming in from overseas and people were, uh, 
donating outside of the campaign limits. So they did not turn those over to the FEC because they didn't have to. Anything under $200 did not have to be turned in. But when you realize that the whole campaign was built off of these massive small dollar donations, you can imagine how big that list was. And he gave it to ACORN. And that was the list that I was tasked with, finding the maxed out presidential donors and getting them to give to ACORN in violation of FEC rules so ACORN could get Obama elected. And that's around the time that I started to figure out that this wasn't what I wanted to do. I had already tried to come forward earlier. I had contacted in early May of 2007 a group called the Employment Policies Institute. They ran a site called RodinAcorn.com. And I tried to tell them about what was going on, and they told me that it was dangerous to expose Acorn from the inside. And the guy was great. He was a great guy because he could have mined me for data and you know tried to go after Acorn. But he said, no. He said, you just had a baby. You're still inside Acorn. You call me back when you get out, and I will work with you. His name was Brett Jacobs. He writes for big government now, and I will never forget that because that was someone who was actually looking out for me, a conservative, something that I, you know, I never thought that that would happen. I thought it would be one of those, you know, come in and we're going to get all this information, but no. And so I decided to try to change ACORN from the inside based on that conversation and see what I could do. But at the same time, I was also collecting information. And that's where I was in 2007. What happens when your team is winning, but your team is cheating? I thought Obama, Obama was a great guy. Honestly, I did. I was a liberal. I was looking at the hope and change, and I was thinking, you know, the country really needs change. But I didn't really think to ask what type of change, and I don't think anyone did. It was just, you know, we got caught up in that whole PR thing, because that's what it was. It was a big PR press thing to get Obama elected. So I decided I was going to expose ACORN so Obama could do his job. And the only way to do that was to get rid of them, because they had a socialist wish list. Cap and trade card check, universal health care, and the, the so-called environmental justice initiatives that they're pushing that's letting the EPA run wild. These were the things that they wanted to do within the first 100 days of Obama being in office. I knew this, and I knew that they had uh, enough leverage over him that they were going to get it done, because the way they talked, it's like they had a direct end into, into his campaign, into him, and that there was, going, there was no doubt that these things were going to pass. So I contacted the New York Times. I don't know, how many of you remember the Acorn embezzlement scandal? Some, okay, his, uh, the founder of Acorn, Wade Rathke, his brother Dale embezzled um, over a million dollars, only they only reported a million, but it was over a million dollars from the organization. And uh, Wade Rathke was forced to step down from the organization in July of 2008. The New York Times reported on this. Bertha Lewis assumed uh, the head of Acorn. I'm pretty sure you guys have seen her on YouTube or other places with the dashiki and the braids. So what they did was they put a black face up there in a time of crisis to make it look like it was an organization run by black people, but it never was. On national staff, it was two black people and I was one of them. So it just lets you know this was all a strategic PR move. And that's why I contacted the New York Times. I wanted them to know what was going on inside of ACORN, that this was all a cover up and they were trying to really look, make it seem like everything was okay because it was 2008. They could not crumble right before their big guy was about to get elected. So they were doing everything they could to, to control the damage. And that's when the whistleblowers started coming out. It wasn't just me, it was former board members, it was other people that were giving this person information. Her name was Stephanie Strom. And she wrote several articles for the New York Times, but they were all watered down. They were all more damage control or puff pieces than anything else. So after working with her from July of 08 to October of 08, I started not to trust her. And think about this now, a liberal, working with the New York Times, the paper of record, the old gray lady, I had faith that they were going to do their job. And I think that a lot of that is just being young, idealistic, or whatever, but it was very shocking to learn that they were basically carrying water for Obama. And as I started to do that, I started to look around too. I contacted CNN. They did a three-tape interview that never aired. ABC News and Martha Raddix were able to verify the story, and they wouldn't run with it. It was just amazing how everyone, no one wanted to get the truth out about what was going on with Obama. <laughs> Hold on, guys. We'll come back to that in a second. I'll fix that. Uh, what was going on with Acorn and Obama? It was amazing. I didn't understand why. Um, I didn't understand why no one wanted to listen. And that's when I started to realize that I had to go outside of the left. So I contacted Michelle Malkin. And this was a total 
Like, I don't even, I can't even explain to you. Because Michelle Malkin terrified me. If you're a liberal and you're reading her blog, she's scary. <laughs> and then you see her on TV and she, you know, she's like, eh. you know, I, I was terrified, but I knew she was the only person that got it because I read the stuff on her blog. Unfortunately, she never got that email. Everyone sends emails to writemalkin at gmail.com. She puts that email address out there for everybody. And later on, when I was talking to her and she was writing her book, Culture of Corruption, she told me, she's like, I will always kick myself that I never got that message. But that's not how it was supposed to go. It played out the way it was supposed to, unfortunately. And that was that Obama got elected. People didn't really get to find out about the illegal coordination until after he was already in office. And I didn't understand either, because I voted for him on election day with my daughter um, in a stroller in the rain, because somehow it always rains on election day. But there we were, and I thought I was doing something. And then came January, and my little world came crashing down, because I'm sitting there thinking he's going to do the right thing, because he's Obama. And he starts picking his cabinet, Leon Panetta, strong acorn ties. Kathleen Sebelius, uh, she took the, um, the State of Kansas is playing to DC to accept an award from Andy Stern uh, with the organization I was working for at the time back in, um, what was this, July of 2008, American Rights at Work. American Rights at Work is a pro-labor organization funded by SEIU that was pushing card check. You know who sits on the board of American Rights at Work, or did? Hilda Solis, the new labor secretary, sat on the board as treasurer. Kathleen Sebelius became Health and Human Services Secretary, and they were all there in DC at this meeting planning how to get universal health care passed. So when I started realizing that these were his picks, you can't be a good guy if your whole cabinet is full of corrupt people. So I became an ex-liberal. I never thought about becoming a Republican. I just knew I didn't want to be a Democrat anymore. And since I was more of a liberal than a Democrat, I just put ex-liberal on my profile. And it was liberating, because I was like, I'm through, I'm done. And this, that's when, and this is going to sound crazy because I tell people all the time, they think social media and Facebook and Twitter are just for fun. But after Iran and the things that happened in 2009, people should realize it is life-changing. It was life-changing for me because I'd never been around conservatives. I'd always been, I went to the University of Alabama, got a liberal arts degree, and that was more liberal than arts than anything else. And all my friends were liberals. Um, everyone in my family was Democrats. I never was exposed to conservatives and uh, Republicans or that type of thought. Everything that I got, I got from the media. When you're watching Jon Stewart, and you're, I read a site called NewsHounds, who's um, the tagline is, we watch Fox so you don't have to. So that's how I got my news. I never had been around conservatives, and there I was tweeting out my stories about ACORN, and then people started to pay attention. They started reading my blogs, and this is before I got picked up by O'Reilly or Hannity or anybody. This is just a girl in D.C., a black girl at that, just tweeting out stuff, and they started responding to me. I never thought that, you know, conservatives would find me funny or engaging or we would have anything to talk about. But that just goes to show you how the media and how society tries to divide us. They make it seem like they're, we are so far apart that we have nothing in common. And that was the biggest lesson that I learned. And it was actually kind of liberating to talk to people that I really didn't think were like me and to realize we were all the same, we're all Americans, and that's something that they don't want you to realize. And when people start realizing that, it was like the synergy started happening because this was right when the movement picked up. This is when we had the first tax day tea parties, smart girl politics, American majority, freedom works, all of these groups were just gaining steam early 2009, and I was right there with working with them. I worked with smart girl politics for over a year, doing training before American Majority picked me up and said, you know what, we love your voter for our training, come work with us. And once again, a conservative organization, you would could have knocked me over with a feather if you had told me that three years ago, I would have thought you were crazy. But that's the way things worked out. And I realized that it wasn't just about talking about ACORN. And I used my blog to expose them and to expose some of the things that were going on. But it was really about fixing the things that not only I had done, I wrote the political plans for Colorado, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Ohio in 2006. Those political plans helped us take back the House. I was on at Capitol Hill in the VIP area when Nancy Pelosi took the stage for the first time as Speaker of the House. And I am embarrassed to say this, but I cried because I had done that, we had done that. And so I had to fix that. You can't 
you know, mess up and create a world that you know, your children can't even live in and think it's okay. Oh, I did my job, I'm going to go sit down. No, we've, I've got to fix it. So that's what we're doing now. We're out here working with groups, and I say we because it's not just American Majority, it's not just Smart Girl, it's all of the activists and the people that I'm working with on Twitter. We're trying to fix this. And part of that is teaching election integrity. Part of it is what's going on in uh, Houston, Texas. I don't know if you guys have heard of True the Vote. It's an um, initiative run by the King Street Patriots. They are putting a million poll watchers across the country. We're taking this national. We're going to get out there and stop the Democrats from doing these shenanigans because traditionally because there has not been conservatives at the polls in these highly uh, urban areas. So they're able to do whatever they want to. When they came in Harris County, Texas, which has one third of the population of Texas in that one county, they screamed voter intimidation. They screamed racism, 60s style intimidation, all of this because they had the nerve to put conservatives at the polls and have them as poll workers. But we changed that. We came down there. We're working with this group, King Street Patriots. We're working with Heritage Foundation. We're working with I Caucus, um, Campaign for Liberty. Everyone is part of this. If you have something that is out there and you're trying to get, you know, make change, we all need to work together. And that's what I've been trying to work with um, recently. I was in Dallas on Wednesday with a group of conservative groups from across the country. And the one main thing that we had is that we don't do this on the right. We don't work together. Everyone wants to go off and reinvent, reinvent the wheel. So, and we also don't have a ground game. So what, what we're doing, and I just want to tell you a little bit about this, is that we're creating the first massive field plan for the right. This is not GOTV. This is a permanent infrastructure that will work in the minority communities. We're not bringing in handouts. We're not preaching social programs. We're bringing in uh, prosperity, capitalism, trades, giving these people options. When you price them out of college and then you uh, undereducate them, their only option is the government dole. And we're trying to stop that. And we're going to show that after 40 years of social programs, Tea Party groups, Libertarian groups, Republican groups, whatever, can do more in these communities in six months than they've done in 40 years. And that's going to change the dialogue and the debate. Because when you get out there and they're saying, oh, they've all they got is a race card. Obama can't run on his record. He can't run on his character. All he can do is divide the country and scream racism. But when you've got conservatives active in the communities out there, taking back America block by block, that takes away the race card. Then what do they have? and it becomes an even playing field. So that's where we're heading in 2012. I'm going to talk today a little bit about the uh, election integrity and voter fraud, but just know that there is a plan in the works for us to take back this country. And it's not just me, it is conservative groups from across America that are banding together, and hopefully there'll be more information coming in the future. If you want to get involved and, get, and want your group to be a part of this, just email me at anita at americanmajority.org, and I will put you in touch with the planners. But we want to do this, and we want to use you guys to do it. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. If you're working in these communities and you need resources, or you need bodies, or you need training, we will come out out and work with you and let you do your thing because who knows your community better than you do? Yes? Could you say that again a little slower, please? Anita at AmericanMajority.org. Thank you.